Shabbat Shalom. Our Torah portion uh, today is going to be in Leviticus chapter 17 and verses 3 and 4. So I'm going to read a little slow and uh, hopefully you can identify some words and, and, uh, and read along with me. Ish ish mi beit Israel asher yishtach yishchat shor o kesev o es mamachane o asher yishchat michutz lamabane veel petach o chel moed lo heviur Leakriv korban ladonai, lifne mishkan adonai, dam yechashev la ish ahu, dam shafar chafach, vanikrat ha ish ahu, mi kerev amo. Amen. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom, Chag Sameach, praise the Lord. We, uh, we miss Pastor Wayne this evening. He and Ali, our administrator, is, are in, in Israel. And uh, so uh, hello to Pastor Wayne and the, and, and the team that are there. And I know they're being blessed, praise God. So glad that you're here this evening. The passage that we just heard Pastor Joey read to us comes from Leviticus chapter 17. The passage says, whatever man of the house or of Israel who kills an ox or lamb or goat in the camp or who kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, the guilt of bloodshed shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood. And that man shall be cut off from among his people. The passage tells us that there's really only one place. God's very specific about this. There's only one place on the planet from which he will accept a blood offering. This is why the Temple Mount is so significant. And really, this is why Hanukkah is so significant. Because it is about that place. This year, Hanukkah is December 7th through December 14th, so it actually begins at sunset on Sunday evening. It begins uh, in South Lake. It'll be at 5.23 p.m. this Sunday evening, and it'll be the Feast of Lights. Now, Hanukkah is an unusual day if, if you, uh, if, if you uh, are not too familiar with it because it's one of those days that's actually not really mentioned in the Jewish Bible. In fact, if you were to actually look it up online and see what it actually says, for example, in Judaism 101 or in My Jewish Learning on the, on, on the Internet, it'll actually say it's not mentioned in the Jewish Bible. Well, we'll consider that possibility later. But, but if it's not mentioned in the Jewish Bible, then we have to ask the question, why did you celebrate it? On the other hand, it is mentioned in John chapter 10 in the Gospels. In John chapter 10, the New King James says, Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked to the temple in Solomon's porch. Now you may not know the phrase, the feast of dedication, but the TLV Bible translates it this way for us. Then came Hanukkah. It was winter in Jerusalem. Yeshua was walking in the temple around Solomon's colonnade. Now, that's kind of really kind of funny if you think about it, because Hanukkah is never mentioned in the Hebrew Bible and the Jews celebrate it. It is mentioned in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and the church doesn't celebrate it. <laughs> the only time it's mentioned in the Gospels, though, is when our model for life, Yeshua, is going to temple on that day. To really put it in context, we might want to say it this way. Hanukkah is only mentioned in the Bible one time when Jesus went to church. And it's a big deal for him to go to church, because, to go to Jerusalem, to the temple, because this is a long walk for him. I mean, he probably walked 20 miles to get there from where, who knows how far he walked that, but to get there. He walked, and he went to temple on that day. So it was a significant day. It's, could be, it could be significant in the Lord's life for another reason. 
Most of us probably know that, I don't want to pop any bubbles now, but most of us probably know that Jesus was probably not born on December 25th. (laughs) Now, it's okay to celebrate December. I'll celebrate Yeshua every day of the year. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. I'm serious. We, we, We celebrate both in our family. But... But he probably wasn't born on that day. Most scholars think he was probably born in the fall. Most Messianic scholars, not all, but most, would say he was probably born during the Feast of Tabernacles. And John chapter 1, verse 14 alludes to that. And the Word became flesh and tabernacled, Feast of Tabernacles, tabernacled amongst us. We looked upon his glory, the glory of the one and only of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, if the Lord was born on the Feast of Tabernacles, and if you move forward nine months from there, then it suggests the possibility that Yeshua was actually conceived around the time of the Feast of Lights. That's kind of interesting. So it's, you might think about the Hanukkah candles that we'll light in a little while. You might think about them as birthday candles or conception candles. What I'd like to do this evening is I'd like to do two things. I'd like to tell the story of Hanukkah because it's a good story to tell. And then what I'd like to do is to talk about the significance of the story for you in your life today. I think that that both things are, are good to do. So first the story, Hanukkah the story. There was a Greek warrior king by the name of Alexander, Alexander the Great. And as a young man, Alexander the Great conquered the world as they knew it. And then he actually lamented that there was nothing left to conquer. Well, he caught the flu, and he died at the young age of 33 years old. He he lost, I guess you could say. But Alexander had no sons. And so his kingdom was divided up by his four generals. Ptolemy became the king of Egypt. Seleucus became the king of Syria. Lysimachus became the king of Thrace and Turkey. And Cassander became the king of Macedonia and Greece. And two of these kingdoms became really significant in Israel's life. Because Syria was to the north, and Egypt was to the south, and these two kingdoms would constantly war. And in order for them to war, they would have to travel through the Promised Land. In the year 171 B.C., Antiochus IV became king of Syria. Now, Antiochus is a proud man, and so he renames himself Antiochus Theos Epiphanes which means Antiochus, the visible God. This guy had a big head. (laughs) The Jews called him Antiochus Epimanes, which means Antiochus, the (laughs) madman. Well, in 167 BC, he led an invasion against Egypt. Now, the Egyptians expected this attack, and so they cut a deal with a new rising empire, the Romans. And when Alexander got, or excuse me, when, when, the, um, when, when Antiochus got down into Egypt, he was met by a Roman legate and his army. And the Roman legate turned to Alexander and he said, do you want peace or war with Rome? And Antiochus stalled in his answer. And so the Roman legate actually took out his sword. Imagine, I just, imagine he took out his sword And he drew a line in the sand, if you will. Doesn't seem to be making any noise, but you can imagine. He just drew a line in the sand around him. And he said, Antiochus, if you step outside that line, that's where we get the phrase, a line in the sand, it's from that scene. He says, if you step outside that line without telling your army to withdraw, he said, I'm going to kill you. My entire army has been ordered to kill one man you. Now, Antiochus is a proud man. He cares about his skin. He says he does what you would expect. He tells his army to withdraw. And now he is fully humiliated, and he is angry. And he begins to march back to Syria, which, of course, takes him through the promised land. He comes into Jerusalem. He destroys a large part of the city. He burns the city walls. He burns houses. He slaughters and enslaves tens of thousands of men, women, and children. The army sacks the temple. They smash the temple gates and the temple porches. They steal the golden vessels and the treasures, including the golden candlesticks. They take the golden altar of incense. And then Antiochus sets up an idol in the holy place 
an idol to, the, the, to their, their god Zeus. And interestingly enough, the idol has the face of Antiochus himself. This is a proud man. He commands the Jews to worship this idol. It happens to be the 25th day, by the way, of the 12th month. Not exactly the same as December because it's the lunar calendar, the month of Kislev, not the month of December, but around the same time of the year. He, he, he has a pig sacrificed on the altar, and he sprinkles pig's blood in the Holy of Holies. The temple is converted into a shrine to Zeus, and the only animal allowed to be offered in the sanctuary is swine. The Jews are forbidden from, from practicing their faith. He forbids circumcision, which is the sign of Abraham's covenant. He forbids Sabbath worship, which is the sign of, of Moses' covenant. The Jews are forbidden to, from keeping kosher and under pain of death. Whole families are killed. Babies are hung around mothers' necks, and then the women are thrown from the city walls. Many faithful Jews are fleeing from the city. They go to places like Petra. You probably have heard that name before. And some of the Jews resist, and they begin to revolt. One of them is a 90-year-old man by the name of Eliezer. Eli the Syrians tell Eliezer that he must eat pig in front of the crowd. He refuses. They say, look, if you'll eat, if you, we'll let you eat something that's kosher if you'll just tell the crowd it's pig. He says, I won't do it. They beat him to death in front of the crowd. There's a woman by the name of Hannah. She's got seven sons. And one by one, they are given the opportunity to apostatize. And one by one, they turn it down. They cut off the boy's hands, and they rip out the boy's tongues. And then last of all, the mother is killed. The Syrians come to a tiny village called Modin, 17 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And there they built an altar to Zeus. They order an old priest by the name of Mattathias to sacrifice a pig to Zeus in honor of Antiochus the madman. Mattathias refuses and another priest offers to do it. Mattathias is enraged. He rips a sword from the Assyrian soldier, and he kills the soldier, and then he kills the priest. At this point, his five sons erupt in anger with him, and these five sons and Mattathias kill all of the Syrian soldiers in that outpost. Then these six men destroy the pagan altar that's there, and they run to the Judean hills where they hide out. Within one year, Mattathias, he's an old man, he gets sick and he dies. But his five sons continue to wage guerrilla warfare. One of these sons, his name is Judah, he's the third son. He becomes known as Judah the Hammer. The five of them become known as the Maccabees. And under Judah's leadership, the Maccabees have some stunning victories. The greatest victory was actually on a road from Emmaus to Jerusalem. Now, some of you will know that name, Emmaus, because it appears in Luke 24 in the resurrection story. In Luke 24, the Bible says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. This is the place. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem, and do you not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. In other words, we had hoped that he would be the next Judah Maccabee. We had hoped that he would be the one who would defeat now the Romans after Judah had defeated the, Assy the Syrians. And what is more is the third day since all this has taken place. This is the same place where Judah the hammer had snatched the victory from the Syrian claws. And after his resurrection, Yeshua, with his nail-scarred hands, shows himself to these two disciples in the same place. And he announces that he has essentially snatched death from the claws of, of victory. He has won the victory. He did it in the same place. 
He did it on the road from Emmaus to Jerusalem. He did it in the place that the scripture calls, as it were, on the road to the beloved city. It's interesting, many of you will know that the scripture actually calls Jerusalem the city God loves, or your translation might just say the beloved city. The context, though, in which the Lord actually calls it the beloved city is kind of interesting. It's found in Revelation chapter 20, in verses 7 and following. Now when the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. In other words, the city that God loves. This is speaking of Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Jerusalem is called the beloved city in Revelation chapter 20 at the end of the age when the enemies gather together, attack it, and God says, enough, and he brings final victory. He says, this is the city, this is the stone that if any man tries to move, he says, they will only hurt themselves, and he comes to the defense of Jerusalem, and it is when he comes to the defense of Jerusalem that he calls it the city that he loves. This is the place in Luke 24 on the road from Emmaus to Jerusalem, where the Lord announces himself as the one who will bring, has brought victory over death. This is the place where the Maccabeans finally make that last great defeat of the Syrians, and they then from there leave Emmaus behind them and come into the city of Jerusalem. And as they come into Jerusalem, having defeated the Syrians, what do they find? They find that the temple has been burned. They find over the last three years that the weeds are now waist high. They find this idol to Zeus in the holy place. And they begin the process of cleansing the temple. It takes them eight days to actually cleanse or de rededicate the temple. Eight days is a significant time in Scripture. Babies are dedicated and then circumcised on the eighth day. In Exodus 29, Moses' original altar was sanctified for seven days and then dedicated on the eighth day. And the Feast of Tabernacles is a seven-day feast with an eighth day for a closing ceremony. And so on the eighth day, the Maccabees are able to rededicate the temple. It is exactly three years to the day after Antiochus has defiled the temple. It is the 25th day of the 12th month. And on this first of these eight days, they come into the temple. And they look for oil to relight the eternal light. They can only find enough oil for one day. They think, what do we do? They do the only thing they can do. They light the eternal light. And then they begin the process to prepare more oil. But it takes eight days to prepare the oil. And on that first day, they light the light. They wave the palm branches, which are like the, essentially the Israeli flag in those days. And they sing the Egyptian Hillel, Psalms 113 through 118, the, the psalms that are sung uh, during the Passover because of the, the victory and the exile. And at the end of the first day, the oil doesn't go out. And we come to the second day, and they sing the Egyptian Hillel. And the light doesn't go out. And they sing it the third day, and the fourth day, and the fifth day, and the sixth day, and the seventh day. And on the eighth day, the, the oil is still burning, and they bring the new oil in, and they light the eternal light. And so today, we Jews celebrate Hanukkah by lighting candles. We give gifts for eight days. We don't want our kids to feel left out in December. <laughs> Actually, my oldest memories of any holiday, I was thinking about it. Is it Passover or Hanukkah? And it actually would be Hanukkah because of those gifts. <laughs> we give gifts. We, we play with the dreidel. And if you, if you hang out at the party, um, I thought I brought a dreidel, but maybe I didn't. You'll see little dreidels out there, and, they'll, and we play with them. We spin the dreidels, and there's four letters that are on the dreidel. And what, what is the, the point of the dreidel? Well, what happened was Antiochus said, you cannot teach your children how to read Torah. Well, Jews 
unlike other people groups, have always had a high literacy rate because we've always thought it was important to train our kids how to read the Torah. And so when the Syrians came by and they would, they would see parents with these dreidels and they would say, you're teaching your kids how to, how to read, how to, how, to, how to read the Torah. And they'd say, no, we're not. We're just playing a little gambling game. And they'd spin the top. But there were, four, there were letters, all the letters of the alphabet, and they would, they would teach their kids. And so what we do today is we, we play this little gambling game, if you will. And the four letters that are on it are the nun, the gimel, the hay, and the shin. The nun for the word ness, the gimel for the word gadol, the hay for the word hayah, and the shem for the word sham. Ness, gadol, hayah, sham. A great miracle happened there. And so we spin the top. And if the, the nun shows up for ness, then nothing happens. If the gimel shows up for gadol, the word for big, then you win the whole pot. If the hay shows up for, ha- for hayah, then you win half the pot. And if the shin shows up for shan, then you have to put a coin back in the pot. And what we do is we don't play for real money. We pray for Hanukkah guilt. Hanukkah guilt is basically chocolate coins. And so if you win, you get a sweet tooth. Yeah. You know, you've, you've probably heard the saying, if you haven't, you, you will, I'm sure you'll hear it again. All Hebrew feasts have the same theme, all of them. They tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. <laughs> <laughs> and so what they do is they make, we make the food, right, that matches the the celebration, like for Passover, you know, you, you eat matzah, okay? And so for Hanukkah, what we do is we eat fried foods. And so fried potato pancakes, latkes, we eat, we eat fried donuts, any, anything that's got oil is what, is what we do. Now, friend, at the beginning of the sermon, I said that if you look up in, in like on Jewish websites and stuff, the sites will say that this holy day is never mentioned in the scriptures, But actually, it kind of is, because the events of Hanukkah are prophesied in the book of Daniel. So it doesn't say Hanukkah, but the events of Hanukkah can be found prophesied in Daniel 8, especially Daniel 9, and in Daniel 11. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, the Bible says, in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And so the middle of seven would be the middle of a seven-year period, a three-and-a-half-year period, right? Three-year period. There we are. He will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on a wing of the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. This is really exactly what Antiochus did. He set up an abomination of desolation. He set up a idol to himself in the holy place in the temple. Now, Daniel wrote that about the year 560 B.C. or so. And about 350 years later, roughly year 167 B.C., Antiochus does this. He does exactly that. What's really interesting, though, is that the Lord Yeshua refers to that in Matthew chapter 24. When in verses 15 and 16, he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains like the Maccabeans did. But actually what Daniel said, what happened, actually happened. So what the Lord is actually saying is what happened with Antiochus and with, uh, with the Maccabees is going to happen again. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, when he says, These things happen unto them for examples for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So in other words, the events of Hanukkah are going to happen again. There is going to be some kind of a major event in the last days surrounding the circumstances of the Temple Mount, where the temple is, an abomination of desolation, if you will. There is the Dome of the Rock there right now. There is going to be some kind of a major event in the last days that is going to look like Hanukkah. The stage is set. Well... What about today? 
What is the significance of Hanukkah for you and I today? Well, I want to suggest three ways that Hanukkah is significant for you and me today. First of all, there is the whole issue of dissatisfaction. See, Hanukkah says there's times in life when we can be dissatisfied. We're not happy with the way things are. But you might say, well, Pastor Greg, doesn't the Bible say that we should be content in the Lord? Doesn't it say that? Well, it does. But friend, here's the truth, and we all know it. We can have contentment and at the same time dissatisfaction. The Apostle Paul refers to this in Philippians chapter 3. He says, not that I've already attained. In other words, there's more. Or I'm already perfected. I'm not. But I press on that I may hold on of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. The word apprehended there means to have gotten a hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. He's not talking about forgetting his failures here. Here he's talking about forgetting his successes. Here he's talking about not being satisfied with what I've actually done, with the good yet. There's more to do. He says, this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. In other words, we can have some issues going on in our lives where we can look ahead and we can say, things can be better than they are. They can be better. And you know, the Maccabees looked at the circumstances and they said, I have dissatisfaction. I'm not happy with the way things are at. They saw a lot of opportunity for things to be better than they were. And friend, no matter what your circumstances are, you probably have some areas in your life where you say things could be better. I don't know what your circumstances are. Some work 8, 10, 12 hours a day and you're not happy with your job and you're thankful you have a job. You've got some contentment. You're thankful you have enough money for food or it's being provided somehow. But you look and you say, I'm not satisfied. Or maybe you say, my marriage, I'm thankful. Is, it is what it is, but there's some things about it. I'm not satisfied. I want it to be better. Or I love my kids. I'm content. I love my kids. But you know what? They are running from the God that I love. Or Messiah is not the center of my home like I want him to be. Or my financial situation is not what I want it to be. And you feel this sense of dissatisfaction. And Hanukkah says there's times in life when we feel dissatisfaction. And the second thing that Hanukkah says, the second area of significance is it offers hope. Hanukkah is the festival of lights. It is the festival of hope. It is the festival in which God says, I am your deliverer. When a Jew thinks about Hanukkah, we think about Judah the hammer. We think about a man who fights as though everything depends on me. Yes, I believe in God, and yes, I will trust God, and yes, I will pray, and yes, I will, I, I, that is absolutely true. But Judah fought like a man. He got engaged as though everything, to pay. he put his all in all into it. That was Judah. Our New Testament says in James chapter 2, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. We need to have active faith. The word Maccabee is actually an acronym for the words Mikamoka Bilim Hashem, which means, who is like you among the gods? God. Who's like you, God? The word Maccabee, then, is the statement of one-pointed dedication to the one true God. You know, if they had been pragmatists, they might have simply cowered before that Greek army, 40,000 well-trained, well-equipped. They had elephants, the, the equivalent of tanks in their day. Of the five Maccabean brothers, four will die in battle. Only one will live to see the Syrians actually leave. And he will actually be killed by a Syrian plot seven years later. But these guys are committed 
to restoring godliness in the land. They are wholly leaning on God. And you know what? There's one way that we can demonstrate that we are wholly leaning on God, and that is through prayer. In James chapter 4, the Bible says you do not have because you do not ask. You know what that says to me? That says that there's things that God wants to do in my life and in your life that he will not do, and he wants to do them. But he will not do them until we ask. It's like he who sits on the throne in heaven sits on the edge of his seat, and he says, if they will only ask, and if they will only keep on asking, if they will only engage me in prayer, you do not have because you do not ask. Sometimes we just need to keep pressing on in prayer. And so Hanukkah is this, this day that says, it's okay to have times where I'm not satisfied and I'm going to do something about it because God offers me hope. And if I get engaged, he will help me. He, is, he, is, he will become engaged if I will get engaged. There's times where God gets engaged just out of grace and mercy. But there's times where God's really just waiting on us. That happens, friend. And then finally, number three, Hanukkah is significant because it says that we are to be people of service. It says that we can express dissatisfaction on the on behalf of other people. I'm not happy with where my brother or my sister or my kid is at or my boss is at or my whatever is at. I'm, I'm, Lord, I'm not happy with their circumstance. And Lord, I begin to enter into prayer for them. And the way we, we, we celebrate Hanukkah, one of the primary ways is with this candelabra. There's eight candles here in the back, and these represent the eight days of Hanukkah. And then there's the one candle in the front, the shamash. The word shamash is the word for servant or attendant. And the, the shamash is used because according to Jewish tradition, these eight candles can't be used for anything other than decoration. They are only to look good because it's all about celebration. And so we need another way to light these candles. We need a servant. We need someone who will serve. And so we have the shamash, and we use it to light the other candles. Baruch atah Adonai, lehenu melech alom, asher kertzanu b'metzvotav, v'tzivanu lehadlikner shel Shabbat, or excuse me, shel Hanukkah which basically is, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has blessed us and sanctified us and commanded us to light the Hanukkah candles. And as you're here today, as we get ready to close, One of them may have a mind of his own. There we go. I want to ask you two things. I want to ask you, first of all, if you have the light of the Lord in your heart. He has died. He has risen again. He has defeated death on your behalf. And I want to ask if you have received the Lord yourself. What better day to do it than today? I want to encourage you. Let today be the day that you do that. And then secondly, I want to ask you, do you have an area of your life that you're just not satisfied with? And you'd like to have somebody pray with you? Don't come to the house of prayer and take that burden home without lifting that need to the Lord. There are people here tonight who would love to pray with you. Everybody needs prayer. I love the way Pastor Robert leads us like this. Everybody needs prayer at some point or another for something. Lift it up to the Lord tonight. And you can be the shamash. You can be the servant on the behalf of someone else. 
There may be someone else that has a need that you know about. You can make a difference in their life. You can bring their need to the altar this evening. So as the worship team is here, as they lead us in this closing song, if the altar team would come, excuse me, those who are going to lead us in prayer, if, if, if you'd come, there are some, some prayer warriors up here. They would just love to pray with you. So as we, as we close in this last song, whatever it is that you need prayer for, anything, please, please come and get prayer for this.